I have a mantra to try and reduce, if not eliminate, manual work where we can with technology, mm -hmm. to reduce or eliminate paper-based work where we can, and to have as much workflow as possible. We've made a choice that says, actually, we're better placed learning how to partner with specialists who can invest in capabilities and maintain them. Then therefore, we do have a very strong vendor partnership function. Think about the sorts of things you like doing, not necessarily the job that you're going to do. I was a chemical engineer, I was a business consultant, I was a transformation leader, I'm now a CIO. We really are stretching the boundaries of what the digital world could do, even though we will move back to some element of physical, so we will then merge those two as we move forward. This is CIONA TV. My name is Hendrik Deckers. I'm here today with Sanjay Patel, who is the group CIO of Tate and Lyle. A very warm welcome, Sanjay. Thank you, Hendrik. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Sanjay, you have a degree in chemical engineering from the Imperial College in London, and you started your career 34 years ago as a plant manager for ICI. For 21 years, you worked at IBM, uh, but for companies such as Unilever, Nestle, and PepsiCo. And in 2016, you joined Tate and Lyle. So, Sanjay, let's start with a very simple question. Where are you from? Well, Hendrik, that's a simple question, but maybe not such a simple answer. Um, mm -hmm. I'm Indian origin. My parents mm -hmm. are from uh, northwest parts of India in Gujarat, but I was born in East Africa, in Nairobi, East in Africa. Kenya. Mm -hmm. And then at age six, uh, we came to London, uh, okay. where I really had my formative years, and as you say, graduated from Imperial College, the Masters in Engineering. But then I moved to the north of England, mm -hmm. um, a place in Teesside in North Yorkshire, where I lived for eight years. And then I came back to London, um, and after I got married and, and we had uh, our first child, we moved to Switzerland for seven years. And now I'm back in London. So <laughs> it's an interesting question, where am I from? Uh, my okay. roots are clearly in London, uh, but I'm mm -hmm. Indian origin and my heart is in India. Okay, uh, but, but you started as a chemical engineer. And, and, and so how did you arrive then in, in IT? Can you tell that story a bit? Well, again, uh, not, not a simple path. You know, if I, if, if I could say, hey, when I was little, I wanted to be a CIO, <laughs> I would be lying. Um, I, engineering and taking things to pieces and putting them back to, together again really was the sort of genesis of my career path. Uh, but after eight years in, in engineering, running chemical plants and improving them, uh, I wanted a broader perspective in terms of what other industries were, were out there. And so I joined business consulting uh, at that time with Coopers and Librand, which then became PwC, which became IBM. And that was really to get exposure to a variety of different businesses and understand how businesses work. And also to be a bit more commercial than the sort of technical engineering ladder that I'd started from. Um, yeah. After 20 years at IBM, you learn a lot about IT, even though that wasn't the core of my role. My role was really transformation and working with companies uh, around their operating models, uh, how they would organize themselves across many different functions. IT was always a constant uh, in terms of the technology enablement of those transformations. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's really how I came to the sort of conversation around, well, why not be a CIO and actually transform by using technology, which is what I do today and what I love doing. Okay, great. And, and you were hired in, in Tate and Lyle, but it's not necessarily a household brand. But so could you give us a bit of context? What is the company all about? What is it that, that they sell? How big is it? Give us some context, please. Sure. Look, Tate and Lyle today, we're about four and a half thousand employees, uh, around four to five billion. Um, but we have a long history. We're over 160 years old. And actually, Tate and Lyle was a household name and continues to be for some people because they remember okay. through those 160 years that we were a large sugar business. In fact, at one point, we had the largest shipping fleet in the world because oh. we were moving across continents, uh, sugar cane uh, to sugar refineries and, and around the world where people needed those sorts of products. And also through that process, we invented shelf life and products that would say long life in shelf because we had people on ships for three or four months that needed something to sustain them. Uh, but over the years, as we continuously transformed, we got out of the sugar business. And so Tate and Lyle today, Hendrik, to your question, we're a food ingredient business. Mm -hmm. So we're the ingredients that go into many food and beverages. And so the, the, the customers that you cited, the Nestle's, the Unilever's, the PepsiCo's, the Kellogg's, 
they are our customers and we provide ingredients to them. Ingredients that help with sweetening, so sweetening is still a large part of our business, but not through sugar, through alternative sweeteners, whether that's high fructose corn syrup or other sweeteners like stevia, which we've just yep. got into. We also provide fiber, we provide stabilizers and texturants. So things that typically on your supermarket shelf you wouldn't know about, but they're the ones that keep the shelf life. They're the ones that stop yogurt dripping all over you. They're the <laughs> ones that keep ice cream stable on a, on a warm day. They're the ones that give texture to biscuits. So those are the sorts of products that we go into. Um, and our customers are any food and beverage company that you'll know on the planet, of which clearly we're not engaging with all of them. And so we have a significant potential if you think of the scale of the market for food and beverages. Okay, great. So it's a, it's a very old company, but that has DNA to reinvent itself uh, every, every so often. So, so what are the drivers of change today or over the last couple of years where Tate and Lyle is being faced with and, and, and how, do you, how does the business attack these uh, challenges? Well, look, like some businesses, it's the same challenges in terms of consumers. So ultimately, mm -hmm. our customers, customers are consumers. And as consumer eating habits change, um, eating and drinking habits change towards healthy wellness, that's clearly a driver for us. And we lean into that because we are plant-based. We're based on, on corn and now with, uh, with stevia and also with tapioca. So we're expanding our plant base. Uh, so that plays into consumer trends. Our products are, are both GMO, non-GMO, so that plays into clean label. Uh, we also provide fiber, so in terms of some of the challenges that are, uh, are in the world today, whether that's diabetes or obesity, we play into that particular space as well. Um, sustainability, you know, we're a manufacturing company, therefore we do have a carbon footprint and we do consume water, we do consume energy, uh, and we're about to publish our sustainability targets uh, into, the, into the world. Um, and then from a recycling perspective, you know, we actually provide ingredient into paper. Um, and a lot of that is recyclable uh, because it is plant-based, uh, but we also use packaging. And so many of the challenges for large industry are the, the ones that are facing us. At the sort of revenue growth perspective, um, in fact, when I joined Hendrik, I, I joined as the head of transformation okay. um, to, to, to sort of continue the journey on transformation. And that transformation was really having got out of sugar to focus from products to categories. Categories being the things that you see in the supermarket aisles like bakery, beverages, um, dairy and otherwise. And so our products are aligned to those categories because that's how our customers think about them. And also because then we can see the growth potential within those categories and align to how those categories that consumers are buying um, are aligning to the ingredients that we can provide to our customers. Okay, and, and, and on a higher level, I mean, the, the company needs to reinvent new categories, new products and so on. What's the, what's the impact on IT? How is IT supporting that change of the company? Well, look, well, again, on the back of the work that we started a few years ago, our strategy has sort of three strands from an organic growth perspective. Sharpening our focus on customers. So from an IT perspective, how do we interact with our customers? What's the value proposition that we're making to our customers in terms of the ease of collaboration with us? Is it harder for customers to move from us to other providers? Uh, and therefore, is the technology so wired um, that that makes it easier for them to do that? Um, accelerating our portfolio transformation. So that's an element of insights, which products and categories are growing, which ones aren't, where are the opportunities for adjacent categories. So that's data mining and insights. Accelerating mm -hmm. the innovation pipeline. So how do we then shorten the time to market? And how do we get better at the insights that we have with our customers based on knowing how our ingredients perform and therefore giving them new recipes? And lastly, simplifying our business. And IT, again, plays a lot, large role there in terms of automation uh, or workflow, uh, or leveraging technologies to do those. So sharpening our focus on customers, accelerating our portfolio transformation and innovation pipeline, and simplifying the business. And then we have the non-organic, the inorganic, which is the M&A agenda. And therefore, okay. the agility to acquire businesses. We've just acquired two businesses side, and integrate them so that we become one integrated family and can then leverage those, uh, those acquisitions to time to value. Okay, so a lot of change going on, and so the business is changing, IT is supporting that. But that also means that to reinvent business, you need to reinvent the way that we work. Because next to technology and, 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 uh, and, and so on, the way that we work is important. And so I wanted to discuss with you three different topics uh, today. One is 
how the workplace uh, is, is working today, how we modernize, reorganize, transform the workplace. One, the second thing is how the workforce is organized and how our people are changing. And then uh, the workflow, the automation that we already uh, touched on. So let's talk about uh, the workplace uh, in, uh, uh, to get started with. I mean, the pandemic has changed a lot in the function and the role of the workplace. So what's your vision and, and Tate and Lyle's vision on, on the workplace of today and the future? Look, as you say, the pandemic was a great change catalyst. Um, mm -hmm. But in reality, Hendrik, before the pandemic hit last year, uh, we'd already started as an IT function to take some basic tenets of uh, user experience um, and unified communication. Mm -hmm. So it's basic things like building blocks of the, the network that allows us to work anywhere on any device. The devices that we were using and the standardization of those so that they could have biometrics or otherwise on them, um, and the capabilities on those devices so that you could be anywhere and communicate with each other. Uh, we bundle that into a program we will call Better Ways of Working. Mm -hmm. okay? And as the pandemic hit, we've deployed that very rapidly. Within three or four weeks, in fact, of uh, the pandemic hit last year, the whole company yeah. was working remotely. Um, last March, which is right at the beginning of the pandemic, which is the end of our financial year, we closed our books remotely. Mm -hmm. okay? We met our investor deadlines exactly as we would as if we were working in, in, in the office. So the way in which we worked have changed dramatically, accelerated clearly by the pandemic, but we've yep. continued that journey. Um, and we will continue that journey in terms of collaboration with customers, in terms of uh, data repositories and storage of data and access of data. Um, so that really has changed the workplace. The workplace is no longer a physical environment in an yep. office. It's anywhere you want to be on any device. So how do you see the, the role of the office in the, in the future? And what's, what's the strategy of Tate and Lyle for this? We're not going to return to the tradition of anyone who has a location will physically be in that location. We will have a hybrid model. We'll mm -hmm. inevitably make an office space available to people. It will be a very different office to the one that we're used to. But yep. we will also allow um, remote working. And I say remote because you don't actually have to be at home to do that working. So it will, we will move to a hybrid model. We're also using that opportunity not just to change the, the nature of the workplace, but also to change the nature of the work and some of the cultural norms around hierarchies and senior people having offices, around what you can and can't do in open spaces, around indoor and outdoor space in an office. So we're exploring all of those things. Uh, we have a project team in place, we have a steering group in place. Um, to drive that, but we're at the beginning of that journey as people start returning uh, more and more to a hybrid place of work. So Sanjay, you're doing a greenfield, new, uh, new office. So in, in your view, how does the, the office of the future look like? Look, we've, we've been thinking about this through the pandemic because we've mm -hmm. seen a lot of advantages of the remote working, mm -hmm. um, both from an employee engagement perspective, the personality in terms of you get personal view into people, they're not necessarily dressed up, the hierarchical change, the, the need for managers no longer to be standing over, walking the corridors, understanding what people are doing. So we want to capture a lot of those advantages. And as we move back into um, office space, we're, we're going to be using a hybrid approach. Yep. So some people will be in the office for quiet work, teamwork, collaboration, and uh, working in groups. Others will stay remote. Um, we've been exploring the, the principles of that. And clearly, a key part of that is the technology enablement of that, making sure that the experience that people have in an office environment is the same as those that are not in an office environment, so that there are no sort of winners and losers between those two. Taking advantage of some of the new technologies around health and wellness and making sure that we encourage people not to be at their desk all day long, which is very easy to do at home because you've got the flexibility in potential anyway, but typically in an office environment, you don't have that. So we're building a lot of those things in line with our purpose. Our purpose is to improve lives for generations, and that includes the lives of the people that come to work for Tate and Lyle. And all of that is being built into the, the sort of strategy as we move to hybrid working. Yeah, so the, so the, the office is going to change. We'll have a new function. We, we will be working in a hybrid mode. I mean, many of us will... Uh, as, spent quite some time working at home. Do you also see an evolution in the home office? And, and, and are you providing some tools uh, for your people for that? 
Yeah, so look, a lot of that we have provided. So as a standard, my function is available to anyone who needs something at home, be that a screen or even a second screen, be that a headset, um, be that speakers on the desks or otherwise. The one thing that we don't cater for and which we, ca we can't cater for is the internet provider at home. I mean, that's mm -hmm. sort of beyond the bounds of the company, but everything else the company has provided. We provided funding for furniture um, for individuals so they can you know, furnish the, the, their homes for uh, office type equipment. And then all of the other technology we, we make available to all of our employees so that they are really set up at, at home. Clearly from an application on the device, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a mobile device, tablet or, or a laptop, we are Microsoft Teams. Uh, and so that suite is is deployed alongside all of the OneDrive so that documentation can be shared and also document sharing can be made much easier. So all of that capability, uh, we're working in partnership with Microsoft and have continued to, to stretch that capability. Okay. Also in terms of our customers, because we can't travel, we've made available access to Tate and Lal, be that through our labs where a lot of tasting takes place, or be that through some of the, the innovation work that we can uh, collaboratively work with them on workshops. So breakout rooms and flip charts, we have that made virtual. As we start traveling, we've also made available travel kits. So Asia is already open in our case. It's the first to close down, the first to open up. Travel kits so that one person can go to a customer site and then open up the laptop and a screen and can then dial in remotely all of their colleagues. So that doesn't mean seven people have to travel. Okay. Right? So we're saving on travel costs, but we're also making sure that the customer can get access to people who hadn't previously been thought of coming to that meeting. We can just dial them in wherever they are in the world and have them in that customer meeting. So we're stretching what technology can do as we move to hybrid, as people start traveling again, or as people start wanting to be in the office again. And so you organize virtual tastings of the ingredients that, that you work with with your clients. That's cool. Right. Yeah, we tend to take our ingredients and formulate the product. So we'll mm -hmm. bake a biscuit, uh, yeah. which is different to you know what the customer is using, send them to the customer in the virtual world. They'll taste it, we'll taste it, and we'll have the look and feel on the screen. And then we can actually reformulate and have a dialogue on, 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 you know, in, that, in that particular meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a virtual kitchen. So on a digital site, um, customers can go to a kitchen and start looking through those products and then seeing what ingredients are in those products and what they could change those ingredients. So we really are stretching the boundaries of what the digital world could do, even though we will move back to some element of physical. So we will then merge those two, the digital world with the physical world as, as we move forward. Okay, great. So, so the, the workplace is going to change dramatically. And uh, let's talk about workforce. I mean, you, uh, you, your company, 4,500 people, um, um, you've got a great team in IT as well. How do you see that changed? Has it changed already a lot? And how do you see that change in the future? Because all of a sudden location is, is, is less, uh, in, uh, less important than before. So we could recruit around the world and, and find top talent wherever it is. What's your view on that? Well, look, we are we are doing that, Hendrik. Um, as I've moved the IT function over the three years that I've been the CIO, we've been a, a very clear eye on the capability changes that we will need within IT. Um, mm -hmm. So we're building agile capability because the, the the deployment cycle is much shorter now, and the capabilities and technology is much better now. We're building analytics and insight and data science and data modeling capabilities. We're building cloud-based capabilities as we go to data lakes. Um, you know, and, and cloud-based infrastructure. So all of that capability building is happening inside IT. And I'm using two very simple models, build on the inside and buy from the outside. Mm -hmm. And that combination is helping to accelerate that capability. Now, when we talk about our users, they're also having to evolve in terms of the user experience because typically yep. they were used to one exposure to technology. Now we're making a lot more technology available to them. We're making apps available on their mobile phone to know if there's space in the office that they can book in. So we have an app for booking space in the office. Uh, we're making things available to them on a mobile device that traditionally they would have sat at a desk. We're making new technologies available on their, on their desktop. So mm -hmm. the capabilities from the user perspective is also shifting. And as we make new technologies available that are more automated and workflowed, they're having to learn to do more things on a workflow as opposed to paper-based or manual. Um, so we have a, I have a mantra to try and reduce, if not eliminate, 
manual work where we can with technology, mm -hmm. to reduce or eliminate paper-based work where we can, and to have as much workflow as possible so that we can segregate things um, you know, in a system and, and pass them on for approvals in a system as opposed to having to use email or physical. Okay, let's talk a bit more about the workforce and let's, let's focus a bit more on, on IT. How, um, how big is your IT team, internal, external people, and, and how are they, how is, what's the operating model? So look, firstly, we're about 40% smaller in internal IT than some three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we've simplified the structure at one level. So I have four towers that sit underneath me. One which is um, a combination of IT security and IT operations, so SecOps, We've moved to security and operations in one place so that we can both run the company and keep the lights on and keep it safe at the same time. So SecOps is my first tower. Second tower is on delivery. And there, the capability that we've kept in-house is really around strategy and solutioning because all of the development work is now done externally. The third tower is really about enterprise solutions and user experience. So that's where the enterprise architecture sits, but also user experience in terms of adoption of the technologies. And that's a geographically diverse because we are in every region. And then the last tower is the new one that I'm building, which is a sort of chief digital officer tower. That's the new tech space, which has got data analytics um, and advanced technology and RPA in it. And that's the mechanism for bringing new technologies in, which will then flush its way through delivery and into mm -hmm. operations. Um, so that, that's the, the, the model that I have covering both regions and functions. So we have global functions being mapped, mm -hmm. and then we have the regions being mapped. So I'm covering the way the business runs. In the business, we have global functions, and we have regional businesses. And how, how, big, are, how big are the teams? How many people do you have, internal, external? We're role? about 120 internal and about 250 external. So I actually have more dedicated people in IT outside of the company uh -huh. than I do inside of the company. Almost twice as many external as I do internal. And so your background being IBM and uh, with working with outsourcing and so is, is, it's not strange to that, I would say, right? <laughs> no, not at all. And, look, and I picked up a journey that we started a while back in terms of deciding what is it that we really need to do as Tate & Lyle IT? Mm -hmm. And what is it that other players or providers could actually do better than us or that yep. that's the core of their business? The core of our business is to understand the business partner with the business, educate the business on the potential of, of technology, and make sure that we're managing that estate as it yeah. evolves and managing the delivery of projects. Those are the core capabilities that we've got. Everything else, whilst we could do it, and I know many other IT functions that have that in-house, we've made a choice that says, actually, we're better placed learning how to partner with specialists who can inv invest in those capabilities and maintain them. Uh, and, and therefore, we do have a very strong vendor partnership function uh, in terms of the key partners that we're working with. Great, so that's how we look at, at workforce uh, at the moment. Let's talk about workflow and, and, uh, and about automation. Uh, so you already mentioned that you're working hard on, on doing back office automation and so on. So, so let's talk about back office automation. Let's talk about robots, uh, software robots, uh, RPA uh, for everybody. Let's talk about low code, no code. Let's talk, start with the back office uh, thing. So what is your vision and strategy for back office automation? Because we're at the, I would say, in a new era for, uh, for automation, right? Yeah, so look, we're a manufacturing company. So at the, at the heart of it, you know, we have a core ERP that sort of mm -hmm. runs the backbone of our company. So we are SAP, uh, we're on, on premise at the, at the moment. And we also have for our HR function, a cloud-based solution in Workday. For our sales function, we have a cloud-based solution in Salesforce. So immediately you can see that from, a, from a, a landscape perspective, we have both old and new technologies in that space. Our infrastructure yep. um, is about to move into the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, so that, so that, that landscape enables us to then start thinking about new technologies on that foundation. Put simply, if I have one place where all my financial data is, one place where all my HR data is, one place where all my commercial data is, one place where all my recipes are, the layer on top is where I can start building across those data sets to drive insight. So yep. we are now in a data lake that allows me to take multiple data sources from different places and in a relatively near term 
um, near real term basis, provide that insight to the business, which is where automation workflow robotics comes in. So we have, we've started the journey on robotics. We have our first bot factory being put in place, finance, back to your point about back office, but also in supply chain. We're still early in the AI machine learning space. Mm -hmm. we're, we're starting with analytics and insights uh, around pricing and commercial areas and getting some insights on pricing that, the, that will allow us to be more agile and nimble in terms of what we can do year on year in terms of pricing. So, so we're starting on that journey, but the vision is very clear. Um, enabling AI um, and the associated technologies is something that we did as part of the company strategy uh, about 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. We basically looked into 2030, so 10 years out. So what do we think the world could look like? across all dimensions, sustainability, water scarcity, consumer patterns, um, geopolitical and technology. Mm -hmm. And we concluded that there were some opportunities for us to invest now that were no regret. So no matter which of those futures came true, we needed to start investing in some of those spaces and the AI and technology space is one of those. So we started road mapping um, some of the no regrets investments that we could make in that space. So you're building a factory of robots, a, a bot factory, as you call it. Tell me a little bit more. How 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 do you build a, a a robot factory? How do I need to visualize that, and how do you manage that? Look, as as with everything, start small. Right. Mm -hmm. So we started with single bot. Um, we picked a technology. In reality, the first thing we did was pick a technology because there are a number of technologies there. We've mm -hmm. selected UiPath as our technology uh, platform. And we started with use cases. What were the most simple use cases from a business perspective that we could automate? And we built single bots. Uh, we actually worked with four to five different providers, the integrators who had the okay. capability to do that because that was our mechanism for learning. So in the simple a human being crawls, walks, runs and flies. We're sort of learning to crawl and walk on the bot journey. Uh, we're now having to learn about how to orchestrate bots. So yes. bots watching bots, because in a factory you have to have managers managing the people. Well, we're doing that bot managing bots. And then how do you orchestrate that? And ultimately, the human intervention is to manage the management of bots, managing the bots, <laughs> managing the bots. So we're just in that point at the moment. Okay, but that's great. So you have people managing bots that are managing bots. So that's that's pretty cool. I think that that metaphor works quite well for me. So let's also uh, talk a bit about citizens' development. So do you see that everybody will be using the bots, uh, software robots on their own PCs? Do you see uh, your users uh, using low code, no code tools? So so what's your vision on that? How how free do you want your the people in your company to um, develop their own tools. Look, this, this, is a, this is a difficult one, Hendrik, right? And mm -hmm. There's no right answer. So I'll, I'll give you my sort of perspective at this point in time. And I say that because my perspective can evolve as I, you yep. know, as I, as I learn more and as the technologies evolve. So, so having spent a, a chunk of time making sure that we've sort of got our arms around IT spend, because at mm -hmm. the end of the day, IT, like many other support functions, is an on cost of the business. So it's a cost that gets taken out before you make your profit. So you know yeah. we clearly are a, a cost burden at one level. And we minimize that to the best of our ability by consolidating and making sure that we've got as few applications as possible. Um, and therefore, from a you know, the phrase of shadow IT, we have very little IT that's not controlled by IT. So in that world, um, managing what the allow the users to do is where the paradox comes in. So my perspective is anything that touches code or impacts on code that I would like to have done once, we will manage within the ISIT function. Yeah. So then when it comes to visualization, um, digestion of that data or insight, that's really up to the business. And there we're allowing them to use all sorts of tools. So whether it's a Power BI template, uh, traditionally known as Excel was the tool of choice in those days, the business can do that. So that's where the balancing comes in. In terms of code, we don't really do customization in Tate & Law. We're buying sort of packages off the shelf. Um, and so we're not really into code building, but where there's an opportunity for the business to buy an application or buy you know, a cloud-based solution, we're allowing them to do that if it's the consumption is limited to that particular function. Um, so, that, so that's our stance, right? Anything that needs to be kept sort of whole and um, managed, we maintain within ISIT. Anything else that's about user agility and allows them to 
get the insight that they need to run their business, we'll allow them to do that on the business side. You um, told us that you have four different towers in, in your IT organization and you're building a new one. One of the four is a new one around data and data analytics and so on. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Where do you see the, the low hanging fruit? Where do you see the first results of, uh, of your efforts there? Yeah, so look, my, my original vision was to segregate new technology from the sort of traditional three towers that I had, right? The delivery mm -hmm. tower, the user experience, enterprise solutions, and SecOps. And so my initial experiment was to make it a technology tower um, mm -hmm. and bring in new technology like robotics, um, like analytics. And in order to make that whole, I sort of had data architecture in there. I also had data delivery in there and then data management in there because traditionally the, the guts of the, you know, the data sits in master data. And so I brought all of that together into one place. As we started learning, the integration of that with the other towers was a little bit difficult. So our sort of growing teeth was if the strategy and the data was done over here, but the execution was done somewhere else, we started sort of having some challenges. So now in my sort of chief data officer tower, we'll have delivery capability as well. So we can actually deliver some of the early pilots, early technologies. I've also brought my regional business partners in there so that in the region where I need the agility, I can create those use cases, deliver them, and then move them across to my delivery tower as they become mature. So that's, that's the model that we've got in place. You know, most have got those sorts of thinking in place, a nursery uh, or sort of, you know, a place where you can practice smaller projects, POCs or otherwise, and then as they mature, bring them into the sort of mainstay of the IT delivery. Okay, let's talk a bit more about your role. How do you see uh, your role as CIO today and how do you see that evolving in the future? Look, I, I think I have an advantage in my humble opinion because I actually come from a business background. You know, all of my time until the last three years, I've really been on the business side, either in transformation roles or in delivery roles in multiple different functions. So that's, that's step number one. The evolution of the CIO as a business leader, um, in addition to a technology leader, so I'm not biased against technology, but evolution into terms of being more a business leader, therefore better partnership with the business. So I spend a lot of my time, uh, continue to spend my time, understanding and working with the business. What are we trying to do as a business, regardless yep. of technology? What are the priorities and where are the bottlenecks? And then translating that to, well, how could technology help that? Because the people in the business know what their problems and challenges are, but they don't necessarily know what technology could help with. And that translation is where I spend my time. Specifically, I have an IT strategy, which is based on the back of our business strategy, and sharing that with the business to say, actually, did you realize that technology could help you to do that? And the re early reaction is, you know what, we hadn't realized you could do that. We mm -hmm. did not realize that that capability existed in technology. And out of that comes the use cases and comes the pipeline. Um, so that's where I'm spending my time. In fact, I did a, a piece of work a little while ago. So where actually am I spending my time? <laughs> so if I look at my diary, how much of my time is managing the technology? Mm -hmm. How much of my time is managing the people? How much of my time is leading and sort of sharing the direction? And how much of my time is with the business? And what I realized is that through the three years, the early years was more in setting up the function, more on technology. The mid-year was really on projects, spending time on projects. And now more and more with my structure in place, I'm spending more and more of my time with the business, understanding, but actually challenging and saying, well, why couldn't we do these things with technology? So it sounds like your job is getting more and more exciting, more interesting. <laughs> from my perspective, <laughs> given that that's the business I come back, you know, that I come from. I mean, one of my, my statements is, look, for, for 20 odd years, actually 18 of those 20 years, I spent with consumer products companies mm -hmm. like the Unilevers, the Nestle's and, and the PepsiCo's. That's all I did five days a week. I don't spend time with those people now. So in order to, to keep my function connected to those customers, Mm -hmm. I and you know the, the, the structure I put in place with the regional business partners and what I call my roadmap managers, they need to spend time to understand what those customers are doing and the impact it has on my business. At the same time as the, the support functions, as you talked about earlier, Hendrik, understanding yep. what is the priority for finance. Uh, today, for example, our new CFO came to present at my all hands meeting. My all hands meeting is the 120 people around the world in IT. We dial into a call every month and then we talk about what's happening in our business. The CFO came to present there. One of the questions was, what did he see as the future of finance? And the person that asked that question was the person in my organization who's partnering with finance. 
so they could get an insight from the top as to what is the future of finance going to be so that we could then technology enable that. Mm -hmm. So you're managing hundreds of people, uh, ex internal, external. How would you describe your management style? How do you make sure that you make your team successful? Um, well, there are two parts of that. How do I see it? And then mm -hmm. how do the people that interact with me see it? Yep. Um, I like to think of myself as someone who is curious. I ask lots of questions, mm -hmm. um, who can operate strategically, but can also operate at a very granular level. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I think that gives me some, some level of credibility that I can get into the content of the topic as well. But at okay. the same time, I allow the teams to do what they need to do. I'm not watching over their shoulder or checking in on them. I'm ensuring that they have what they need to do their job and that they're clear that I'm here to enable them. So I do have, I have regular one-to-ones with my directs, but I also interact with the rest of the function. I have in the, in the virtual world, I have virtual round tables so that people can ask me questions and I can ask them questions. So that's my way of staying connected. So my management style is really one of curiosity mm -hmm. around you know, getting into the detail, um, but then sort of setting the direction and being available to sort of remove obstacles. Okay, and, and how would you describe your leadership style? Because that's, that's more how other people perceive you. So, so maybe a good way to, um, uh, to phrase it is, what do you think your people uh, uh, say about you when you're not around? What's, uh, how, how do they perceive you as a leader? Well, uh, look, a few months ago, I, I did a piece of work um, where I had an external coach come in and work mm -hmm. with me. Um, and they interviewed around 10 people from inside and outside of IT without me being there mm -hmm. to ask about what is Sanjay like when he's at his best and what he's like when he's not at his best. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got some very valuable insights, some, yeah. some of which I was aware of and some of which I was implicitly aware of, but you know, not explicitly aware of. And so some of the things that they said were my passion for the business was mm -hmm. one of the things that they valued as a strength. Um, my, my desire to get results uh, was something they valued as a strength. On the flip side, so let's talk about some of the, the areas where people talk about me when I'm not there, is you know my pace at which I want things done don't always allow people to come on the journey. So sometimes I'm too fast for the people to sort of either catch up or to be able to execute successfully. So that's a watch out for me in terms of making sure that um, I, I've, I've allowed them the time uh, to, to do what, what I want to get done at the pace that I want to, 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 to travel. The second part of, of feedback, which again is a watch out for me, is that I don't always check in that what I asked for and intended to say is what landed. So I'm now taking that on board in terms of checking in and saying, well, mm -hmm. look, this is what I said, tell me what you understood. Or sometimes this is what I said last time, Tell me what you're doing about it. So there is some, some personal growth for me ongoingly in terms yeah. of understanding, you know, where, you know, the, the shadow that you cast as a CXO is, is long, as, as many of my peers have told me. And just being very conscious of that uh, in what you say, in how you say it, but also what you don't say. Mm -hmm. Those are just as important. Um, so those are some of the things that, that I've had as feedback. Let's talk a bit more about your personality. Sanjay, you shared that uh, your MBTI profile, which we use as a common thread in our leadership deep dive interviews, is uh, an ASTJ. Uh, so your Myers-Briggs uh, personality type is described as the executive, and that's somebody who is extroverted, observant, thinking and judging uh, personality. And uh, people with your personality type, they possess great fortitude, empathically following their own sensible judgment, and they often serve as a stabilizing force among others. And they're able to offer solid direction amid adversity. So what I'm gonna do, um, Sanjay, is um, name a couple of typical strengths of people with this profile, and then you tell me which one for you stand out. So people, <laughs> the executive, the ASTGs, they're typically very dedicated. They're strong-willed, direct and honest, loyal, patient, reliable, they enjoy creating order and the excellent organizers. How does that fit the bill for you? 
Well, look, typically, I mean, those are the traits, right? Uh, they all mm -hmm. they all fit. They all fit. Mm -hmm. and, and and as you'd expect, there's a flip side to that as well, right? Um, <laughs> I'm we'll also a Virgo. A I'm <laughs> also a Virgo. So for those that look at the constellation, I'm also a Virgo. And some of those traits are also true of Virgos, as well as people who are ESTJ. OK, so let's talk about the flip side then, because that's the more interesting side, of course. <laughs> the development side of things is more interesting. So. Some people with your personality profile have the following development areas, weaknesses. They can be inflexible, stubborn, and they can be uncomfortable with unconventional situations. They can be judgmental, sometimes to focus on social status, difficult to relax, or sometimes difficult to express emotions. Which one do you recognize or which one have you developed in yourself to overcome? Look, many, many of those traits are true, Hendrik, and, mm -hmm. and it either depends on the day of the week, how tired <laughs> I am or how conscious yeah. I am. Um, many years ago, I did a lot of introspection around me. Why am I the way I am? Uh, not because something was broken. I was, uh, in fact, it was curiosity. Uh, I'd actually met a work colleague of mine who'd left and gone traveling, um, and I met up with them of all places in New York. Um, and I got curious as to what had to happen to this person because what, what I experienced of that person um, was very different to what that person had been at work. And one of the things that that person had done was some personal development. And so I, so I engaged in that personal development. Um, so it was an organization in London and the, the introspection was three full days, three full days, dawn to dusk, where the whole conversation was really, why are you the way you are? Mm -hmm. Good and bad. And I got lots of insights from that, uh, which touched on some of the topics that you talked about. Why we are, why was it that, um, you know, I, I didn't always express my feelings. Why was it that people said I was stubborn or arrogant even in my younger years? Why was it that you know uh, I wasn't necessarily um, able to you know um, build relationships faster than some other people could? I mean, in that room, I remember on reflection, I didn't go and talk to all of the people. And why was that? And yeah, I can be very social. Um, mm -hmm. So out of that came lots of insights about, I guess, decisions I'd made as I was growing up. Uh, as early as the age of four, five, and six, um, when I came from, from East Africa into the UK. Um, mm -hmm. And in hindsight, I remember making a decision that I wasn't going to have an accent. My skin color may be different, but my education wasn't going to be. And that was a key driver for me. Um, I'm the youngest of three um, sons. Um, and I remember, you know, again, later on, making a decision that I was gonna make my parents proud and you know, achieve through academics in those days. By the way, I still do that now. So some of those deci early decisions have taken me through. So from my perspective, Hendrik, understanding myself and the way I am and allowing me time to reflect and say, yes, I recognize that's a trait of mine that's not a positive element of being ESTJ, mm -hmm. but I will learn from that and practice a different muscle, which is pause after talking and check in on what the person has heard recognize that my EQ may not be the same as those that are F type um, and ask how people are feeling. So consciously making an effort to, if you want, fill in the gaps or the flip side of the personality trait. And sometimes that's hard when there's a lot going on. I'm very conscious when, when I, have, I feel I've, there's a lot to do, mm -hmm. I can revert back. And so one of the tricks there is to build time in my diary. Uh, I call it leadership time. And so I have a contract with my assistant that says, when I say take that time out and use it for another meeting, you should tell me, Sanjay, remember, you tell me to protect that time. Uh, so I can protect that time and get some thinking time, some reflection time. So there is you know, lots of tactics around catering for continuing to be the best that I can yep. and also catering for the times when I'm not the best that I can be. So making your parents pride, uh, making your family pride, is that, is that important for you? It's a key value of mine, mm -hmm. as, I, as I've discovered when I've done the value work. Um, recognition at some level is a key value driver for me. Achievement is a key dri value driver for me. And the heart of that was really about making my parents prior. Now, by the way, it's probably making my children prior, right? I have a 13-year-old <laughs> and a 15-year-old. So the transference of who am I trying to make proud is, is, is still there. So you have an, an, a nice family, you have two kids. What are the, beside that, um, what are the other values that you're passing on to them? Integrity is very important to me. I think you talked about it in the personality trait. And again, given my background and upbringing, uh, doing what you said you would do. 
um, is really important to me. And again, in fact, it's a re sort of reputation trait I have. You know, when Sanjay says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. So I think that's important that you know for, for my children as well. Uh, a level of honesty. Honesty is about well, you didn't do it, and cleaning it up. So I use a phrase of cleaning up. If you know, if you make a mistake, it's okay. We're you know we're human, and we will make mistakes. But clean it up, apologize. With, you know, with with uh, humility and honesty. Humility, it's sort of in my DNA, um, and that's hard with my personality type somehow, right? Because there's a confidence that comes with it. Um, but those that have got to know me know that actually there's a softer mm -hmm. side and there is a humility into it. Do you have any mentors in your life or coaches or people that you look up to, people that pl play an important role that you learn from? Um, probably all of those. I mean, there's lots of people in the sort of outside world, be that um, a Mahatma Gandhi type person or a Nelson Mandela. I mean, the traditional icons. Mahatma Gandhi, in particular, given his origins and his background, he's also a Gujarati, which is where we come from. Um, he also had lived in Africa for a while, so there is a lot, lots of similarities <laughs> in that respect. Um, but in terms of um, coaches, I actually have an external coach. Um, have had for yeah, some 20 years now. Um, in fact, he was coaching me on the program that I touched on earlier on where I spent three days and there was a curriculum for that. And at the end of one of those coaching programs where he was the coach to a team of seven of us, he asked me a question which I won't forget. He and Because it, it, it struck me as a strange question. He asked me if I would coach him. So here's someone that's been coaching me for six months asking me if I would coach him. And my response was almost instantaneous. I said, only if you coach me. So we've had this coaching relationship. He's a professional life coach. He's written uh -huh. five best-selling books. He's a train the trainer. Uh, he's full NLP trained, and that's what he does for a living. Uh, for 20 years, as he's built that business, I've coached him and he's coached me. Um, and that's the outside of work. In work, I actually have a coach inside work as well, um, okay. because contextually, um, it's important to have, in my opinion, someone in the work environment, particularly as a CXO. Um, mm -hmm. It's not something that you learn how to be a CXO. And as I said earlier, and the shadow that a CXO casts is long. And so I have an internal coach as well at, at, uh, at, at Tate and Lyle. And then I have a number of, I would call informal coaches, relationships that I build where I trust people for advice and counsel. Sometimes the point that you made, Hendrik, about what do people say about me when I'm not there? Mm -hmm. um, because I think that's important to have that sort of 360 on an ongoing basis, not just a formal, you know, once a year, every three years when you do a 360 process, but to have an informal network that knows you and trusts you well enough to tell you as it is, uh, both when you do something that is worth applauding, but also in particular when you do something that didn't really land the way you intended and there's some learning there for you. Let's talk a bit about Mahatma Gandhi. I'm, I'm intrigued there. What is, what is it that you admire uh, uh, from him? What is it that you look up to uh, when, you, um, uh, when you read about him, when you um, uh, see his, 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 his work, his life? I think there are a number of traits in people like Mahatma Gandhi. So, so I focus on him because of the sort of origins, but dedication to a cause, mm -hmm. steadfast for decades because something was important, um, humility, you know, the, the Christians have this phrase of the Samaritan, which is if they're slapped on one, turn the other cheek. Well, Mahatma Gandhi did a lot of that, right? Yeah. Um, and so that, that's about staying true to something regardless of the challenges and obstacles. Um, and each one of us, me included, has had obstacles in my life. Um, and so having that, you know, ability to look at someone who has had similar, and more extreme uh, adversities and still come through because they believed in what they did. Something that my mother taught me, um, she was you know, the matriarch of the family, she held very true, family was very important to her and family is also very true to me, it's another thing that I teach my children. Um, that, though, all those were all encompassed in, in, in the stories that I've heard and the books I've read about Mahatma Gandhi. Not unique to him, I'm sure the tr same is true for others, but I home in on him because I sort of grew up learning about the Indian origins, the independence, um, the racism I faced when I was growing up. So lots of similarities that I can relate to, uh, which is why I single him out. And lots of traits that I hold true uh, in my life and, and, and aspire to sort of keep going as I age and uh, you know, move, move, move through the generations with my children and hopefully their children as well. And Sanjay, you've built a very successful life, a very successful career, um, a nice family and everything, but like all of us, we have our obstacles in life. We have good things that happen to us, we have bad things that have happened to us. 
Can you share a couple of, of really bad things that happened to uh, you and how that shaped your life and, and your, the way that you look at, uh, at business and at, at yourself and life itself? Uh, yeah, sure. I look, one of the earliest ones I've touched on a, a couple of times was the, the racism that I faced when, mm -hmm. when I first came to the UK. Um, it, it, it was severe. I mean, it was daily. And I, at, at the age of six and seven, you don't really understand why mm -hmm. that's going on. Um, and that, at one level, scarred me in mm -hmm. terms of you know, my desire for equality. Um, I have an inclusion and diversity council in ISIT. In fact, Tate and Lyle, uh, we've re just recruited a global head of inclusion and diversity. Okay. And that really calls to me. Another reason why I stay with Tate and Lyle and love Tate and Lyle is that our value sets are very much overlapping. But that was one um, in the, at a very young age. And that teasing and bullying that went through to my formative years uh, really is sort of built a foundation of equality and everyone, you know, is equal. That, that, that's really made a big shape. Um, other diversities, I lost my, uh, my eldest brother to cancer. Um, in fact, both him and his wife both passed away through cancer. Neither were oh. smokers, by the way. Um, and I lost my mother a few years later. Uh, in fact, my first year at Tate and Lyon, my mother passed away. Uh, and those are big influences of me. Um, I still tell the story of my eldest brother taking me out. He was six years older than me, uh, taking me out for the day, paying for me and the treats that he had, I mean, the kindness that, that he had mm -hmm. towards his youngster. I, my children even know those stories, even though they didn't really spend much time getting to know him. Uh, and my mother is a sort of focal point of a family and holding that together and the relationships that she'd built over the years. I mean, everyone knew my mother. Um, and then food. Food is a really, really big topic in my life. I haven't even talked about my wife. When I married her, she was just she was a dietitian. She's she's a chef, and she introduces you know healthy living into the family, um, and that's that's had a major impact on my life because Indian mothers traditionally cook. My mother was no different. That's what she mm -hmm. did, uh, even even to her last days. She was always cooking, and people would come to the house, and no one would leave unfed. My wife's the same. Right? There's always food. <laughs> Um, there's always recipes being created. She dreams food and recipes. That's what she does. So food has been a big, big influence in my life. Um, I guess not surprising given 18 <laughs> years I've leaned towards food and beverage companies as my customers and that I'm yep. now working for a food ingredients company. Again, not by design, but uh, that's been a big influence in my life to, to, to have a positive impact. So we need to find an opportunity next time in, I'm in London to uh, go out and have some, some great Indian food together. Then uh, I would. Absolutely. Love to do that. Uh, so Sanjay, uh, do you have any mantras in, in your life, sayings, convictions that help you have to, uh, when you have to make tough decisions or something like that? The phrase I use most when I'm meeting people um, at interview or when I, when I want to solve a problem is, what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, I find that a really insightful question because not many people think of that. And I don't mean grown up in a negative connotation that they're being childish, but you know, where do you want to get to? And then one that I've picked up from a, a, a colleague of ours at, at, at Tate and Lyle is, what problem are we trying to solve? I, 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 maybe there's a curiosity, maybe it's the engineering me in terms of problem solving, but I find those open-ended questions, therefore phrases that I carry with me time and time again, really serve me. Uh, in terms of allowing me to sort of get my arms around what's really going on around me. What needs to happen in a week for you to be very happy on a, on a Friday evening? You say, well, this was really a great week. <laughs> um, balance of work and life. Mm -hmm. So if I've had time to exercise, um, if I've spent time with the kids and, and with my wife, we've had some social time. Um, Things going well at work, what does that mean? That means things that aren't unfinished. I, I'm, I'm a big fan on it, particularly on a Friday. You talk about Friday, right? Which, again, jokingly, I say, hey, it's Friday. Only two more days and it's Monday again. <laughs> Which people look at me and say, wait, 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 wait. What do you mean, right? Because I sort of like breaking the paradigm of, hey, it's Friday, now I can live. No, actually, mm -hmm. you can live every day of the week. So work-life balance, exercise, time with the family, and closure. So adequate closure so that over the weekend, there isn't a work thing in the background. I have, again, a very, very strict policy. When I finish work in the evening, I finish work. My devices are in one room and I physically go to another room. I do not carry my devices with me. Um, so that segregation is very important. 
By the way, that's not how I was a number of years ago. So it's something I've had to learn to actually have that segregation because I think that's important at the weekend. It really is non-work time. Um, so that, that's what matters for me is that I know that I've okay. done what I need to do on a Friday. Um, another phrase, you ask a question, you did today what you did today, you didn't do what you didn't do. Mm-hmm. And so don't sweat about what you didn't do. You didn't do it, it'll still be there tomorrow. And um, a thing that came out of your uh, profile was that uh, it could be dip- difficult for you uh, to relax. Is that something that you have as well? <laughs> or you talk about exercise. Um, so, so tell me, how do you relax? How do you um, um, unwind? Because you clearly work hard and, and are very results oriented then. Yeah, look, I think I think the difficulty to relax is probably a, a historic trait. Um, I know uh-huh. when my wife first met me. In fact, I remember our first anniversary, we were in Egypt um, and I was on a balcony on a phone. <laughs> we were our first anniversary. I mean, it seems funny now, but at that time, that was that was really important. Um, so I think I've trained myself in that respect to relax more. So how do I relax? Um, at the end of a working day, I literally walk down the stairs, or if I'm obviously in an office or elsewhere, I'm at home and I'm time with family. We have family dinners together. Um, that for me is a downtime. And the conversation is typically, how was your day? Um, and so we're curious about what was happening for each other and what we need to help each other with. Um, I have a bunch of sports that I'm into, uh, which help me relax. I mean, they're not things I do week in, week out. I'm a scuba diver. I used to be a paraglider. Um, I do exercise. Exercising really does help me, whether it's on the cross trainer at the moment because we're in COVID mode or whether it's running uh, or cycling um, or at the gym. Uh, And as we know, there's a physiological effect that happens when you've exercised for a particular period of time. Um, I have a lot of books, a lot of personal development books as it happens, but a lot of novels as well. Um, It's something that I've not, not got back into, but that really helps me to relax. There are times when I'm reading with my children Um, clearly when they were younger, but also as we're growing older. So those are the sorts of things that I I, I do to relax. Okay, great. So what are the kind of books that you would advise young professionals to read so that that really have helped you to develop yourself? (laughs) Um, Yeah, I'm not totally sure I'm totally qualified for this, but let me give you a perspective, right? Whether I'd recommend young professionals to read or not. So look, there's a a few personal development books that have really helped me. Um, One is called The Road Less Traveled. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, and it, it sort of epitomizes the journey that you could choose to go on from a personal development perspective. Yep. Um, there's another one which is much more tongue in cheek, but again, is, is phenomenal in that space. And it's called Families and How to Survive Them. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's a dialogue between John Cleese, who's a British comedian uh, and a psychologist, and they talk about families and how to survive them, quite <laughs> literally, right? So it's very literal. Uh, but, uh, but actually those two books have been, have been quite, quite, quite instrumental in terms of the personal development. And then there's a, there's a third one, which, uh, which is a little bit more of a deeper, um, deeper book, and it's called The Lost Art of Listening. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the phrases I love from that book is listening is a gift you give to the other person. And so you can see, I just stopped talking because actually it stops you in your tracks when you think, I'm taking that gift away from people by not listening to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, And earlier we talked about my personality trait and, you know, I can overwhelm people. It sort of keeps me, you know, remembering that you're taking a gift away from people. Um, uh, And that, that, so those, I'd say those three, probably the ones that sort of come front to mind in terms of from a personal development perspective that uh, will help people. So Sanjay, you, you, obviously live a very conscious life, I would say. You've gone through personal development and, and, and so knowing yourself and the world around you is very important uh, to you. Um, what are your biggest fears? What is it that you fear in life that would really, really upset you? Drowning. <laughs> Drowning. <laughs> Drowning is my biggest fear. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I actually don't know why. I, I guess, I, and I don't consciously remember this, but I'm told by my, my mother that when I was four, five-ish, something like that, mm-hmm. my best friend and I, and I, I, don't, I genuinely don't remember this. I can see sort of visions of it, but I don't mm-hmm. remember it. Uh, we were at our local school and there's a swimming pool there. I don't remember that, but I nearly drowned. Um, and I have to say, I didn't have any memory of that until I was a grown person and I started scuba diving. Um, and my, my mother said to me, why are you scuba diving? You're not really a very good swimmer. 
And I said, because I can breathe underwater when I scuba dive. Oh, yeah. And then it sort of made sense. If my biggest fear is drowning and I'm a really ad ad scuba diver, it sort of overcomes it. It says, you know what? I'm not going to stop it. I'm not going to stop going underwater just because I'm not, because I'm afraid right. of drowning. So, yeah, my biggest fear is drowning. <laughs> Well, it's fascinating, in fact, that what the, the family and the context where we live in and the early experience really shape our lives and our yeah. convictions, no? Very fascinating. Yeah. So Sanjay, what is it that you're most grateful for in your life? Uh, look, there's a lot of things, Hendrik. Um, if I look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, okay. <laughs> you know, we're in first world problems, as I use a phrase. Yeah. yeah. So the fact that we have shelter, we have food, you know? we have family, we have friends. Those are all things that can very easily be taken for granted. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the conversations I have with my children, tongue in cheek at one level, but genuinely is, I should take you to Africa and India and show you how people live on the streets. Um, now, I, I, know, I, you know, I, I played on the streets, we didn't live on the streets, but again, those memories of, we didn't have much money when we were there. Um, memories of my mother had to get a job, right? She, she wasn't a working mother, she was a house person, a housemaid, a builder, and she had to get a job and she had to go to factories and make, make, make things so that, you know, we could have clothes. So, so that, that, that really strikes me as wanting to be grateful for the fact that the basics are a given for me, right? And now we talk about houses and cars and holidays and as I say, first world problems. So that, that's probably my, 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 you know, my, my greatest you know, um, um, appreciation that those basics aren't something that me or my family have to worry about on a day-to-day -day basis. So Sanjay, my last uh, question for this uh, lovely conversation, and I really appreciated uh, your time and, and you sharing all your insights is, um, People that are watching these, uh, these interviews, these uh, leadership deep dives, um, many of them are uh, ambitious uh, professionals that also want to become a group CIO and in, in a big international company. What would your advice be to these young driven professionals? Uh, so look, Hendrik, it's been it's been a pleasure, and I hope some of what I, what I've shared with you does help the the, the young professionals. Uh, look, I have a lot a long history of um, working with younger people. Um, mm -hmm. I recruited at my university for six years. In fact, um, I have thirty odd mentees in my function. That's about a third of my function have got mentors, and I'm a mentor to about seven of them. So the question mm -hmm. comes up reasonably regularly. I, look, I would say three or four things. Firstly, you know, if if you're in the education system, then Think about the sorts of things you like doing, not necessarily the job that you're going to do. Yep. I was a chemical engineer, I was a business consultant, I was a transformation leader, I'm now a CIO. So things will change and evolve, but yep. be clear about what you like to do, what you're good at doing. Um, I love solving problems, the bigger the better, which is where the transformation thing comes in. Um, I learned about technology and brought that into, so that you can learn things along the way, I guess would be the second thing. You know, think about what you love doing, don't worry about the role, you can learn things along the way. Dedication. Um, mm. There used to be a TV program a while ago called The Record Breakers and the opening theme or sing song was dedication. And I really do believe in that. I talked about Mahatma Gandhi earlier on about dedicated to a cause. Um, just stay the course, overcome the obstacles, take pleasure in the achievements that you make along the way. Um, and then from a CIO perspective, you know, learn about business as much as you learn about technology. I come across a lot of people in technology. I'm recruiting, we're recruiting about 20 people at the moment. So I do a lot of interviews and I meet a lot of people who are really, really good at technology. And yes, we need those people. We absolutely need people who are very good at technology. At a CIO level, we need a lot more people who understand business and how technology can help business. So if you aspire to be a CIO in the next generation, um, business and IT interaction and the crossover between those two is going to be critical and continues to be critical in my opinion. So, so those would be my pearls of wisdom to use another <laughs> phrase for what it's worth to the viewers. 
Thank you so much, uh, Sanjay. I, uh, I really appreciated uh, this conversation. Uh, thank you for your time, for sharing all this. Uh, and I hope, like we said, to have um, some tea uh, or dinner together very soon and uh, when we can get back together. My pleasure, Hendrik. Thank you so much.